Good morning, everyone. This morning, we're going to the capital city of the human body, which is the brain. Notice where the capital city is. It's in the skull. And with the skeletal system, it's an internal structure causing us to stand upright. But when it comes to the head, the skeletal system now becomes an external structure. It becomes an external structure because it is now protecting the most delicate and yet the most important organ of the body. But when you have a look at the head, you will see seven avenues of access into the brain. There are two ears, there are two eyes, there are two nostrils, and there is a mouth. Everything we hear or have ever heard, everything we see or have ever seen, everything we smell, and everything that goes into our mouth, whether it be food or drink, has an effect on the brain. Our decisions determine our destiny. So how important that we know something about the decision making part of our brain. This is an area that many people are ignorant. The little book, The Ministry of Healing, which I see is up the back in the foyer. It says in there on page 127 that the only hope of better things is the education of the people in right principles. It's a tragic thing today that in Australia, 50% of Australians have, are, or will suffer from some form of mental illness. And 1,700 cases of Alzheimer's is being diagnosed every day in Australia. These figures indicate that many people don't understand their brain and they don't realise that we have more control over, we, over what we do and even what we say than we think we do. So in this short little time I have with you this morning, I'd like to just open the door a little bit and show you the parts of our brain where we make our decision and what influences them. So we're going to begin by looking at the brain. Now the brain, from side on, it looks a little bit like this. And there is what's called the limbic system. And the limbic system basically takes up about that part of the brain. And this limbic system is often called the emotional brain. And I think we all know about emotions. And I think we all know that emotions aren't a very good guide because they go up and down like the wind. But there's another part of our brain that God designed to actually control that limbic system, that emotional part of the brain. So to do this, we're going to have a look at the brain from top down. From top down, you will have a look at the brain like this. And in the front part of the brain, and we're going to call this the right side of the brain and the left side of the brain. And I think the way you're looking, it is. So in the right part of the brain, you could call that the I want section. That's down there. Sorry, not the I want, the I won't. Now this is a very important part of the brain. Where it's very important is, no, I won't have that cigarette. No, I won't have that cup of coffee. No, I won't have that big state. I'll have a bowl of lentils instead. And on the left part of the brain is the I will. And the I will part of the brain is also very important because I will get out of bed and exercise this morning. I will go to bed early. I will make decisions that are helpful for my body. So you've got the I won't and you've got the I will. And we need a little bit of balance in there and that's where we come to. Right in the center is the I want part of the brain. What do I want? Do I want a healthy body? And if I want a healthy body, then I can trigger that I won't do that or I will do that. And God designed our brain so that this part of the brain, just here in the center, is where our goals are. It's called the prefrontal cortex or sometimes it's called the frontal lobe. And this is where our will is. This is where we make our decisions and it made a and the I will or the I want threaded through the <laughs> won't through the through the I want that's actually what should govern our decisions and 
That's so important because our decisions determine our destiny. So in the front part of the brain, this is where our intellect is. This is where our reasoning powers reside. And this is where judgment takes place. It is in this part of the brain where God communicates with man. In Isaiah 1.18, the Bible says, come, let us reason together. You see, this, this is where the reasoning happens. What should I do? Should I stay in bed and have another hour? Or should I get out of bed right now? And that influences whether we do the I will or the I want. That's the way God planned it. Unfortunately, there are many things today that people are doing that are actually clouding or compromising the part where our goals are, the part where our intellect, reason and judgment is. And we've been looking at that this week, though I haven't actually defined it as such. So dehydration compromises it. Late nights compromise it. Lack of exercise compromises it. Bad food compromises it. Bad air compromises it. So on the other hand, when we're well hydrated, when we're well slept, when we've got nourishing food in our bodies, when we're breathing in fresh air, we're having sunshine every day, then the I want part, in fact, one author called it the guardian. That's the guardian that actually influences the wills and the wants part of the brain, which are, of course, affected by the limbic system, which is your your emotional, your feeling part of the brain. What I'd like to do this morning, I'd like to use as my framework the seven mental laws that govern the brain and show you how you can rewire your brain, show you how you can actually change even the way that you think. Isn't that good news? The first law is the law of cause and effect. Effect follows cause with unvarying degree all through nature. And never should the effect be blamed as the cause. I had a lady come to me and she said, I found the cause of all my problems. I've got chronic fatigue syndrome. I said, no, 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 that's not the cause of all your problems. That's actually the effect. <laughs> Even when someone says, I've got depression. Do you know you can't just get depression? <laughs> depression is actually an effect. It is not a cause. There's a very interesting book by an American doctor named Dr. Neil Nedley. It's called Depression, A Way Out. Every chapter starts with someone else's story showing how they conquered depression using some of the simple principles I'm showing you now and some of the simple principles I've been showing you all week. Dehydration affects depression. Late nights affect depression. <laughs> So you can see what we're doing this morning. We're pulling those eight physical laws we looked at this week and we're pulling the eight mental laws together. We should always have our detective off, hat on. Do you know, recently I consulted a, uh, a private detective and I said to him, oh, you're a private detective, so am I. <laughs> I love the detective work of discovering why someone has a certain condition. It's Newton's third law of motion. To every action, there is an equal and an opposite reaction. Proverbs 26 verse two states that the curse causeless shall not come. You know what that means? No problem happens without a cause. There is always a reason. In fact, to say someone just has something is to defy basic science. So we should always be looking at the cause of a problem. And sometimes the problem for depression could be too much coffee, dehydration. So that's the best place to start. When someone comes to me wanting help with depression, do you know that's what I do? I said, start drinking more water. Start easing off your coffee. You could stop your coffee straight away, but you might suffer. A clear indication that it's not doing you any good. I say, start going to bed early. Start limiting your technology time. Start seriously assessing what you're watching and the effect it's having on your brain. Start exercising. But I don't feel like exercising. Yes, that's your limbic emotional brain. But what do you want? <laughs> I want to feel good. I want to conquer my depression so I will go and exercise. Can you see how that all threads into each other? The second law is the law of choice. And the law of choice, as you can see, 
is determined in that I want, the frontal lobe part of the brain, your guardian, where your goals are. This is what you feel like doing, but this is what you want, so that influences your decisions. And when you're well slept, well hydrated, well sunned, well exercised, well fed, that I want part of the brain is a lot stronger. But we've got something else coming here, and that's habit. You've heard of habit? <laughs> habit can be our best friends or our worst enemies. To understand habit, I'm gonna draw your brain cell. Here's your brain cell, it's your nerve cell. And we have one trillion of these in our brain. They're the dendrites or the receiving stations. And this is the arm that comes out of the nerve cell. These are the little filaments on the end. They're the boutons. Here is the next nerve cell. Our nervous system is an electrical system and it does not touch, they do not touch each other. They communicate with each other via little chemical messengers in the brain. And these little chemical messengers jump from cell to cell. So the chemical messengers come in, they're encapsulated in the nucleus and then they're sent down the arm. And they come into the boutons and then they're released out to the next nerve cells. Now those messages can be traveling anywhere between two and 200 miles an hour. Well, in a crisis, Anyone that's been in a war zone, they know you're, you're, you're moving and you're moving very fast. Now, even though you're just sitting here, your brain cells can be moving fast because you're considering everything that you're hearing right now. And when you are hearing the things you're hearing, your, your, your brain is processing it through your I want. In fact, you're probably hearing some things and you're probably thinking to yourself, I won't have that coffee anymore. Or maybe you're hearing some things and you might start to say, yeah, I, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go to bed earlier tonight so that I can, I will get up and I will. Can you see it all threads through that? It's an amazing brain. In fact, science still doesn't totally understand the full functioning of the brain. If someone says, do you have a computer? You have. <laughs> You've got the most amazing computer on the planet, which is the brain. And did you know that everything you're hearing today you will be processing. You'll be processing through your what you want, through your goals. You'll be processing it through your intellect, reason and judgment. And you'll be putting in certain spots. And when you go to sleep tonight, ideally be, between the hours, you'll be able to get to bed by nine tonight. Oh, what a joy, someone's been keeping you up all week. You haven't been able to get in to bed till 9.30. When you go to sleep tonight between the hours of 9 p.m. and 2 a.m., then your brain starts processing and filing the things that you heard today. It's an amazing process. How does it know where to put it? It knows where to put it because where your, your want put it. Mm -hmm. So if you hear that coffee's no good, in fact, it interferes with those neurotransmitters in the, in the brain, causing a chemical imbalance in the brain. If you hear that and you think, well, I don't care. I want my coffee. I will have it. When you go to bed tonight, it's gonna to put it in the spot. I will continue to have it. You see that? But if you're convicted right now and think, nah, I don't want an imbalance in my brain. Ah. By the grace and by the grace of God, I'm going to, I will stop. Can you see, it's probably all happening in your brains right now. I can't read your brain. <laughs> no one else can read your brain. Only the God of heaven can read your brain. And do you know that when you make a decision, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to watch that, those late night movies. I'm not going to play those games late at night anymore because I want my brain to have its rest and reviving. Do you know, as soon as you make that decision, God says, heard you, got you, and I'm going to help you do it. In fact, there's a lovely verse that's in Philippians 4.13. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. There's a power outside of ourselves that can come and help. And that's where we make that decision. God gave us a wonderful thing when he gave us choice. You see, God is not in every man. You would never say God was in Hitler, Mugabe, Stalin. No, no, no. God gave mankind choice. And what a gamble is that? You see, God is a gentleman. He will never force entry. 
In Revelation 3, verse 20, there's a lovely illustration. It shows God standing at the door and knocking. He says, and if, he said, Behold, I stand at your door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and opens the door, he said, I'll come in. Amen. How do we open the door? It's right here. What do you want? I will open that door. He will come in. I won't open that door. I want to do my own thing. God says, okay. He's a gentleman. But it does explain the heartache that we see on planet Earth. Mm. Some people say, how could God allow that to happen? Unfortunately, God gave mankind choice. He didn't want robots. Do you want people to love you because they choose to love you or they've got to love that person? That, that, that doesn't happen, does it? In fact, there's a name for forced love and that is rape. In fact, there's no love there at all. No, God is a gentleman. He woos us. He knocks. In my next lecture, I'm going to show you how he won me because <laughs> I was a long way away from God when I was a teenager and in my old, early 20s. No, he knocks. And God wants us to hear and open the door according to reason, intellect, and judgment. That makes sense. When you get to know a person, what do you do? You spend time with them. You tell them your life. You listen. How do you listen to God? Do you know when he speaks to us? Very early in the morning. So how do you hear that voice? You have to go to bed early the night before. And there's a verse that's in Isaiah 50 verse 4. It says, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I may know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear to hear as the learned. I love those early, early hours of the morning. One lady said, noise me, I can't sleep. I wake up at four every morning. I said, ah, you don't realize that's your appointment with the God of heaven. That's when he speaks to you, that still quiet voice. But he gives us the choice. And if you're watching things, if you're on the computers, if you're on the Game Boys, if you're on the iPads, Facebook, late at night, guess what? He'll be shaking you, but he can't wake you up. <laughs> We've got to do our part. God gave us choice. And one choice that can free human beings from much heartache is the choice to forgive. You see, every soul has had its heartache. Every soul has been hurt. Every person has been used and abused at some time in our life. But it's not what's happened to us. It's what we do with it. No wonder the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks. I was running down a hill in Fiji 11 weeks ago. I had 20 students behind me. The girls couldn't keep up with us. I had all the guys around me. We're running down the hill. And my sarong was getting caught. And I put my eyes away from my feet for a minute to catch my sarong. And there were loose stones. And my feet went out from under me. And I fell. And I fell like this with all my weight on this arm. Well, <laughs> that was very, very painful. You know what God says, wants me to say? Thank you, Father. <laughs> I don't understand that it. it's hurting me. But I thank you because I believe that out of this, God can teach me some great things. I bound it up with a potato poultice, praise God for natural remedies, and went and I lectured for two hours. My arm just loved, loved to sit there. Chalk, that's hard. This is in the remote part of Fiji. But you know, it's amazing what you can do with your left hand. Try cleaning your teeth with your left hand tonight. Whoa, <laughs> it's not easy. Some of the things we go through, they open our minds to other things. The good news is it's 98% better now. <laughs> In the page 127 of the Ministry of Healing, it says nature's process of healing and upbuilding is gradual. And to the impatient, it seems slow. Well, I tell you what, I'm impatient and that was just far too slow for me. God was teaching me patience. <laughs> and when I, after three and a half weeks, I'd had an x-ray, it said no broken bones. And after three and a half weeks, I've still got it bound because it hurt. You know, important to listen to your body. Oh, it loved being bound. I was in Pugwash, Nova Scotia. I said, Father in heaven, could I meet a, a, a physical therapist or something that could just give me some wisdom on this hand? 
And I'm in a meeting and two seats up from me, an elderly gentleman reached across. He said, I'm a retired orthopedic surgeon. Would you like me to look at your arm? Oh, God is good. How long would it take me to book in to see that man? How much would I pay? Yes, I've been an orthopedic surgeon for 40 years. He had a look at my hand, he pushed it here and I nearly hit the roof and he did a few things. He said, ah, oh, you've got a traumatic tendonitis of your extensor pollicis longus. Yes, he was speaking English. <laughs> he said, if you were in my office, I'd cast that. So I went down to the uh, chemist and I found a brace that kept it straight. Praise God. Do you know the Bible says in Psalm 34, 19, it says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Do you know, whatever you're going through, the Lord has an answer. And often we miss out on the answer because we went to bed too late and we don't hear that morning voice. We have a choice. Forgiveness is a choice. Let me tell you the story of a man who came to us. His name was Doug. I said, did you have a healthy, happy childhood? He said, no, I didn't. My father yelled at me all my life. He was 40. He had prostate cancer. I said to him, oh, sometimes that's all you can say. Oh. I kept moving on because I could see it really irritated him. He heard all the lectures. He heard about the power of forgiveness. He heard about the fact that forgiveness is the only prescription in the entire universe that has the power to break the chemical bonds of hostility, anger, and hate. Forgiveness cuts the chains that bind you to painful past. Forgiveness gives you wings. He heard that in the lecture. I talked to him later after the lecture. I said, Doug, you've heard about the power of forgiveness. Have you forgiven? You don't understand. He yelled at me all my life. I said, I can understand that must have been very, very hard, Doug, but you've got quite a serious illness now. And, and I believe that for you to heal, you need to forgive your father. You don't understand. He, and he was, his voice was rising. With fear and trepidation, I pushed it a little bit further. I said, Doug, it'll only take a minute. You don't understand. So I stopped. I backed off. <laughs> Whew. It was getting a little bit volatile in there. I changed the subject. Two minutes later, Doug said to me, I've done it. Oh. <laughs> Congratulations, Doug. Hmm. Now his limbic system, his emotional brain said, don't do this. Can you see that? And all his life, he'd been harboring this. My father yelled at me. My father yelled at me. He yelled at me. He yelled at me. He yelled at me. Can you see what's happening in his brain? What was happening in his brain was he was developing a very strong habit pathway of anger towards his father. In fact, the first week, I heard him telling other people, other guests, my father yelled at me all my life. Can you see he's getting bigger and bigger? And when in the lecture, he heard to forgive. You see, it's not a limbic emotional brain decision or you'll never do it. It's an I want decision. What do I want? I want to be free. Notice what he said. I've done it. No emotion there at all. How could there be? How could there be? Don't wait for your emotions. They'll hold you back. <laughs> you see, the third law of the brain states that your words affect your feelings. So don't wait till you feel like it or you possibly will never do it. And who would want to hold on to that pain? That's why it's so important to know about your limbic system, to know about your emotional feeling system, and understand that your guardian, your all want, that's where you make your decisions. In the Bible, we see Jesus in the garden. He's praying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He knew he was about to be crucified. Notice what he ended it with though. Father, I don't want to do this. <laughs> in his humanity. Notice what he ended with, nevertheless. 
Not what I want, but what you want, God. <laughs> it's all right to express. We've got emotional limbic brains. <laughs> but what do you want? You want to be free? Doug wanted to be free. He said, I've done it. I said, congratulations, Doug. You've probably made one of the most important decisions of your life. When he said, I will forgive, what's still the strongest pathway? My father yelled at me all my life. Now the next time he's tempted with what his father did, he has a choice. Which pathway will he go down? Because he didn't want to be burdened with this anymore. He used his intellect, judgment and his will, his reason. And he said, I won't relate that story anymore. Because I want to be free from this. I will go down my new pathway. And every time he was challenged, he said, I have forgiven. I have forgiven. Till eventually, he had a new pathway. And because he didn't go down that old pathway anymore, it got thinner and thinner. The research shows it takes 21 days to form a new habit. 21 days of going down the new pathway, it's a physical pathway in the brain. 21 days of not going down the old one, it gets fainter and fainter. That second week that Doug was with us, I didn't hear him relate the story anymore. Something else had happened. Something else that science shows us today is quite amazing. But that little book, The Ministry of Healing, it was written over 100 years ago. And she actually talks about it. She says, grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt and distrust can tend to break down the life forces and invite decay and death into the body. Doug did not realise he was actually inviting decay and death into the body. When we cherish or entertain negativity, thorns grow. Thorns grow between the dendrites. You see, when a negative thought comes in, let's do it with Doug. When a ne negative thought comes in, my father yelled at me all my life. It's not fair. But, but, uh, it comes like a breeze through the branches of your trees. And at that point, you can hold it or you can let it go. Now, all his life, Doug had been holding on to it. He yelled at me. It's unfair. He yelled at me. And thorns were growing. And he had prostate cancer. These are your psychosomatic diseases. When he heard this, and with my little bit of a shove, <laughs> he made a decision. I won't go there anymore. I will forgive. His goals, his reason, intellect, judgment said to him, it's time to stop. Yeah. Does it ever say to you, it's time to stop? Because him holding on to this, is it hurting his father? His father doesn't even know. It's the most selfish decision you'll ever make and it's the best selfish decision you'll ever make. Because you let, you let that go, it's not hurting you anymore. Freedom. Doug made the decision to forgive. All right, I will. Yes. <laughs> Whenever he's tempted that day, I've forgiven. I've forgiven. He didn't seem to have any feeling there. Does that matter? Nope. Now, you might be a little bit shocked at what I'm about to say. It's a little bit flippant, but it's a scientific fact. Fake it till you make it. Huh? Who are you faking? That limbic, wild horse emotional system. <laughs> Needs the bridle, needs the reins. Here they are here. And eventually, he felt like it. Because your words affect your feelings. He obviously didn't feel like it straight away because he said, I've done it. But as the days went on, those feelings changed. Because your words affect your feelings. 
And that night, after he'd made the decision, a little bit of battle a couple of times that day, but he stood firm. When he went to sleep that night, little cells were activated. They're called glial cells. And your glial cells are your body's vacuum cleaners. And there are more glial cells in your brain than nerve cells. And because Doug made the decision to forgive, when he went to sleep between the hours of nine and two, the little glial cells came along and they vacuum cleaned up all the thorns. Science is now showing that forgiveness has a physiological effect on our brain to clean it up. When you're lying in bed about to go to sleep, just think, well, when I'm asleep tonight, my body's vacuum cleaners are gonna clean up all the thorns. My brain's going to process properly, file, system, everything that I did in the day. Amazing things happen when you sleep. What happens if you don't sleep? Sorry. But what if you're struggling with sleep? Lay there with the lights out, with all your Christmas trees out of the room, all your technology gone, window open, you've got a new pillow, you've got fresh sheets, you're hydrated, lay there, can't sleep. Start to list all the wonderful things in your life. I'm in a bed. I'm not outside in a ditch. I'm not in a concentration camp and I wasn't beaten today. And I had a meal today, not like some stories I've read of people in concentration camps who had half a meal a day. There's so much to be thankful for. One lady said, I haven't got anything to be thankful for. I said, I noticed you've got two legs. I've met a man with none. I've got eyes that see. You're blind? Do you know what one lady said? When she was asked about her blindness, her name was Fanny Crosby. She wrote many hymns in our hymn books. They said, how do you cope with being blind? She said, oh, it's wonderful. The first face I will ever see is the lovely face of Jesus. Amen. She was so happy about that. Mm -hmm. You see, happiness is a choice. We'll put a few more here. Happiness is a choice. We've got no right not to be happy. No right. If you're not used to smiling, stand in front of the mirror and stay, get, practice it. Practice it. Just practice it. Ladies that have Botox do it all the time. Their skin's so tight it pulls a smile. Just smile. Have you noticed with children, if you smile, you know what it tells them? I love you and everything's all right. Mm -hmm. Can I have that? Sorry, sweetheart. Later. You smile, it tells them everything's all right, but you're firm. Forgiveness is a choice. Just do it. Just do it. You'll get better at it. Practice makes perfect. Practice makes permanent. Repetition is the mother of in retention. And repetition deepens the impression. These pathways are built in our brain. We can rewire our brain. Right up until the day we die, we can rewire our brain. And if you say it's good, guess what? It will be. And if you say it's terrible, guess what? It will be. That's the choice factor. Forgiveness is a choice and love is a choice. Love is not dependent on feelings because our limbic system, our emotional brain, it goes up and down like the wind. So 21 years ago when Michael O'Neill stood in my kitchen and said, look, I've been thinking about things and I think you and I should get married. I said, what? I'd known this man for about 10 years. We were just acquaintances and he's in my kitchen asking me to marry him. I said, this is very analytical. He said, yes, I'm a very analytical person. I said, well, I think when two people marry, they should love each other. You had to think a bit about that. He said, well, I'm very attracted to you and I love your character. And when he said that, I thought, really? I'm very attracted to this man and I love his character. I just thought you couldn't get near him with a 10 foot pole. I've been a single mother for four years. My first husband had been a drug addict. He'd been a single father for three years. He'd been doing some homework. He'd been assessing certain women that he knew. And for some reason, I went to the top of the list. He said he was gonna choose the wife analytically. 
because he knows about this emotional limbic system. It doesn't mean you choose someone you don't like. That's why when he said to me, I'm very attracted to you, very important, and he said, and I love your character. Oh, I said, all right, I will. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> but you've got to remember, we, we were friends. We were good friends. He said, okay, no need to wait, let's get married. But, but you actually can't get married that day. You have to give notice. So we got married two and a half weeks later. <laughs> You know, it was very interesting that that afternoon he walked past the building and my heart began to beat and I thought, what's happening? And I thought, oh, that's right, I'm marrying him. I didn't realise what was happening. When I made a decision, I will marry you, I actually made a decision that I would love this man. Yeah? And now it was safe to put my emotions on that. I didn't have to hold them back at all. I've been married to Michael for 21 years. 21 years in about two weeks. I love this man. Do you know he's never raised his voice to me? Do you know he's never got angry with me? Oh, women, don't we love that? <laughs> Men, take note. <laughs> but women never nag because it never does any good. We've both got a part to play, is that right? Absolutely. There's a book called Have a New Husband by Friday and it's by Keith Lehman. And the lady was reading the book and she threw it down halfway through the book and said, stupid book, all it's doing is talking about me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Your reactions. Love is a choice. And that choice to love can be fed or it can be denied. And there are times when we must not put our love around an object that is unsafe or not ours to take. And love, our love, should be put around an object that is safe, that is ours to do. It should be fed with tender words and loving deeds. One lady said to me, Barbara, it just annoys me the way you serve your husband. I'd like to take you home and train you. I said, ah, oh, but my husband treats me like a queen. Uh huh. One lady said, well, I'm not going to treat him like a king until he treats me like a queen. Well, guess how to get him to treat you like a queen? You start by treating him like a king. You're teaching him. Your words affect your feelings, so be very, very careful on your words. Proverbs 12:18 says, there is that that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. There are some things that need to be said, but you know what? They need to be set under the guidance of the guardian, against the guidance of God who you have invited into your frontal lobe to give you wisdom. And James 1 verse 5 says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the ships of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think he will receive anything of the Lord. And that's why it says in, in Hebrews 4 verse 12, actually down a little bit for verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to that throne of grace, because we have a God that loves us. Can't your children come boldly to your throne, <laughs> into your house? We never knock at our parents' house, do we? We just go straight in. It's our parents. <laughs> this is our father. Your words affect your feelings, so be very careful on your words. Your words reveal your feelings, and you can't let them all out. Some say it's your right to speak your mind. It's your obligation not to speak your mind. You don't know the effect of your words on your hearer. And the proverb that says, he that speak, there is he that speaketh like the piercings of a sword. Do you know who it's the piercings of a sword to the most? The speaker. The speaker. The speaker's getting hurt just as much as the one who's receiving them. And when people speak to you like that, just let it, you know what you say? Poor thing, he's got a problem. <laughs> he's got a problem, you don't take it on. Your words reveal your feelings. What happens if you're upset? What if you're upset and angry? Go for a run. Can't run. Uh, have a cold shower. It's Melbourne. Will it have an even better effect? Have a great big glass of water. Have some chamomile tea. Calm down. 
calm that limbic system, that emotional brain down until your guardian's strong. <laughs> there are some words that should be said. Colossians 4 verse 6 states, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer every man. Your words reveal your feelings, so you've got to deal with them back there, back there in the I want section. And if you're used to losing it, if you're used to what do they call hissy fits? Do you know, it's interesting, children will never tantrum for other children. Have you noticed that? They only do it where they get an effect. So if you're used to losing it, you can rewire your brain. If you feel it coming, run, run around the block three times. The neighbours will think you're crazy because you've still got your 90 on. Do you know that's better than losing it? Yeah? And you'll get better at it. You'll get better at it. And there's a great God of heaven who says, just ask me <laughs> and I'll, I'll empower you. He will. He's, he's got all power. The fifth law is the law of adaptation. We've got a changeable brain. And because we've got a changeable brain, we can rewire our brain. There's two proverbs that talk about it. Interesting to note that medicine only acknowledged it in the last 13 years. One proverb is Proverbs um, 13 verse 20, where it says, uh, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed because of the law of adaptation. It's also called neuroplasticity, soft wired. The other proverb is Proverbs 22, 24, where it says, Make no friendship with an angry man. With a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways. Because of the law of adaptation. When I go to America, people want me to speak everywhere, and sometimes I think they just want me to speak because of my accent. Oh, that was my American friend having a laugh there. But if I lived in America for 10 years, I'd probably get a different accent because of the law of adaptation. Because of the law of adaptation, our brain can grow and our brain can shrink. It is true that there are things that damage brain cells and if they're damaged, they don't grow again. But there are three things today that medicine is showing can stimulate new brain cell growth in the hippocampus part of the brain. Three shockers, we looked at them this week. Three shockers cause a release of brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor is a protein that stimulates neurogenesis. Neurogenesis means new brain cells. What are the, what are the three shockers? They're shockers, prepare yourself. You're gonna really have to get to the I will to do them because they're shockers, fasting. <laughs> an easy way to do it is to have breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, then have an 18 hour fast through to the next morning or come to Misty Mountain Health Retreat where we make it really easy for you and you do two days on vegetable and fruit juices. That's a shocker. It's a shock to the body when the food stops coming. That's one shock. The next shock is finishing every hot shower with a quick cold. Notice I didn't say long cold, I'm kind. That's a shocker. You'll go, <gasps> it's a shocker. But it's going to stimulate your brain to release the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, new brain cells. Number three, high-intensity interval training, running for your life for 30 seconds uphills, then having a break and then doing it again. That's a shocker. feel like you're dying. So people that have been attending my lectures all week, and I'm sure you've been so excited about this, you've been doing it, are you feeling really smart right now? New brain cells. Something else can grow. Every time we learn something new, we develop another dendrite. I love memorising. It's one of my favourite things to do. And every time I learn new verses, another dendrite. If you play the piano and learn new pieces, there are three things that science shows are the most powerful in developing new dendrites. One is learning a new language, um, learning a musical instrument, and memorizing Bible verses because the, the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, 
piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the word of God. That's the Bible. People think I've got a good memory. I really don't. Now that lady who played the piano, she didn't start playing yesterday, I'm sure. And I didn't start memorising yesterday. <laughs> it takes a while. How long does it take to really solidify in your brain? Probably about 21 days. I learn a verse a week. If I do any more, it gets all jumbled up and I can't remember anything. So every time you learn something new, another dendrite grows. That one brain cell can develop 70,000 dendrites. I can hardly get my mind around that one. And you know what the research shows? We can be growing new dendrites right up until the day we die. So there are three things we can grow. We can grow new pathways, we can grow new dendrites, and we can even grow new brain cells. God is so good. What about shrink? When you forgive, when you forgive anyone who's ever hurt you in your life, your glial cells are activated to mop up all the thorns, and the pathway to that memory actually shrinks. So it needn't be part of your daily thoughts. That's the good news. So what's the bad news about shrinking? If you don't use your brain cells, you will lose them. I love the story about the 90-year-old man who learned to play the piano and the 92-year-old man who graduated from law school. It's time, students. Number seven, the last law is the law of diversion. And the law of diversion states that when something is so firmly denied as to refuse any hope for it, the brain has the ability to divert to other pursuits. I love that law. Because sometimes God closes a door, but what's the saying? When God closes a door, he opens a window. An Italian man said to me, no, 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 no. What we say is when God closes one door, he'll open two. Have you found that? When I hurt my arm, Something happened to me the week before. I was in Warburton giving meetings like I have this week and my right hand man, he was the man that was with the chairs, he was doing the sound system, running around, he had one arm and it was his left arm and he was about 63. And every time I looked around there, he was there, what do you want me to do now? I said, how'd you lose your arm? He said, I was seven years old. And he said, and it was an accident down on the farm and it got caught in an auger or something. He said, when I woke up in hospital the, the night after it had happened or the morning after it had happened, he said, I sat up in bed and I said, nurse, get me a pen and paper. I've got to learn to write with my left hand. It's not what happens to you. It's what you do with what happens to you. And happiness isn't things. It's not what's happening to you. It's a choice. It's a choice, and we have so much to be happy about, yeah? So much to be happy about. So when God closes a door, and sometimes he does, he'll open a window. And so the very week after that happened, I fell down and hurt my hand, and I had no right to complain <laughs> because I could still use my fingers, and I had another hand, and I had a man memory in my background who was my best helper, he had one arm. So when God closes the door, say thank you, Father, because God only ever does what is best for us. It's like a parent that says to a child, no, you can't go to the skate park right now. Oh, they feel like they've been hard done by. And then 10 minutes later, there's a huge downpour. <laughs> or 10 minutes later, uncle arrives. So, you know, and then the child realises that it was actually a good decision not to go to the skate park. It's a very simple illustration that hardly be, can be compared with some of the things that happens in our life. But God knows the end from the beginning. He loves you with an everlasting love. And it is by no accident that you are here today and it's by no accident that I am here today. But he doesn't take away our choice. So you can see by what I've shown you this morning that you can rewire your brain right up until the day we die. And when we start rewiring our brain, it will not be easy. 
and I'm sure the lady that played the piano, when she first started playing, it didn't sound very good. Mm -hmm. Does that mean she gave up? She obviously didn't because it's very beautiful. <laughs> it's the same with anything we do. And that's where the I will comes in, I will do this. I will keep at it. And God says, I'm so glad you've made that decision. I'll just give you a little bit of help along the way. So I pray that you look at your brain differently. And my prayer is that you will take up the challenge to rewire your brain. Rewire your brain so that you can have a healthier, happier life. And that's what God wants. He says, I pray above all things that you may prosper and be in health. Thank you.